Um, next slide, please. Uh, my talk is a little different for this session. It's not really about water quality improvement, but about um, an issue that we had that could, uh, you know, lends itself to why we need water quality improvement. Um, so Florida red tide, I think everyone in this session is probably aware of, but a little background. Uh, it is caused by the dinoflagellate Carina brevis, and it's usually present in low area, uh, low concentrations in our area. Under certain circumstances, it can produce brevitoxin, which can cause neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. When this toxin is aerosolized, it can cause respiratory issues in humans, as well as eye irritations. Blooms in our area tend to start in the late summer to early fall. They can last anywhere from a few days to months or over a year. They usually start offshore, but the general consensus is that eutrophication can make these blooms larger and last for longer. Next slide, please. In September of 2017, Hurricane Irma uh, drenched the state of Florida. And the map on the right you can see outlined in red is the Lake Okeechobee watershed with Lake Okeechobee in green and the Caloosatchee River watershed in blue. All of the rain that landed in these watersheds made its way into the water surrounding Sanibel. Uh, during this hurricane, areas that had not flooded in 100 plus years flooded and everything that had accumulated on those lands washed into the Gulf. Next slide, please. S79 or the Franklin Lock is the lower control structure on the Caloosahatchee River, which separates the tidal river um, from the actual freshwater river. Uh, you can see here in this graph shows uh, the discharge of S79. The colored background shows the percentile distribution of historic discharges ranging from 1996 to 2016. Uh, the dark red area in the graph shows where about 50% of previous discharges have occurred. The dark blue area where about 1% and where the background is white, we have no historic discharges in that time frame. So you can see following Hurricane Irma, we had the highest discharge since 1996. And in the few months following that, the flows were 95% higher than those historic flows, bringing a lot of nutrient rich water into the near shore Gulf. Next. So this animation shows the red tide bloom that started in October, 2017 and went until December, 2018. You can, you can see the date in the top left. Um, as we start, we have a, a small amount of red tide. And as we get into uh, the spring, we start to get a, a second wave. And by the summer, it really takes off and explodes in the area surrounding Sanibel. And then in the fall, it starts to decrease and by December, it's gone. Next, please. And here's an aerial picture of how strong that red tide was. Um, very easy to see off the coast. Um, and it looked like this along the whole coastline. Next. This bloom uh, had a devastating amount on the local uh, flora and fauna. Um, Sanibel, the city itself, removed over 370,000 kilograms of dead marine life from the beaches, including 82 Goliath grouper, 21 tarpon. They spent $1.1 million on the removal. Countywide, Lee County removed over 1.3 million kilograms of dead marine life from their beaches. And statewide in 2018, there were over 280 manatees positively or suspected to be killed by red tide. Next. Sanibel even had a whale shark wash up in July of 2018. It was tested for brevitoxin and tested positive, and it is believed to, but not conclusively, 
been proven to be the cause of death. Next. SCCF does the sea turtle monitoring for Sanibel and Captiva. And during this time period, our staff responded to over 250 uh, sea turtle strandings. About 80% of those sea turtles were dead. Um, they started a study looking at the brevitoxin concentration in the sea turtle stomachs. You can see in this graph, the blue bars are their preliminary data. And the orange, orange bars are a previous study that was done when no red tide was present. So you can see how strong uh, the brevitoxin concentrations in these stranded turtles were. Next. So we, uh, we found this dead zone, um, what we like to say by accident. In August of 2018, we were deploying a new wave buoy as part of our recon network. This involved putting divers in the water and the divers, myself was one of them, noticed there was a tingling feeling on our faces. It felt like you had hot sauce on your lips. The area had a strong sulfur smell. There was a black sulfide layer covering the sediment and nothing was observed alive. Uh, you can see those white dots uh, floating in the water in the pictures are dead fish floating by as we worked. Next. So we knew something was up and we figured we better look into it in more detail. So we developed a few different survey methods to get an idea of what was going on. We established transects offshore perpendicular to Sanibel. Um, we adaptively sampled these sites. Depending on what we found, some days we would either skip a site or add a site. Um, this had both pros and cons, but we found it to be the, the best method available with our limited resources. We collected vertical water column profiles using a YSI XO2. We collected red tide samples and we performed some quantitative visual surveys. Next. So um, these are the sample sites we have from September of 26 of 2018. Like I said, our sites varied slightly um, on sampling trip, um, but we did five sampling trips during the hypoxic anoxic dead zone event and five post event. Uh, we're gonna focus on the Northern transect in these next few slides. Next. So here's um, some water, vertical water pro column profiles of that northernmost transect. Um, we have salinity is the blue line, dissolved oxygen is red, um, and depth is uh, the y-axis. If we start at H1A in the top left, that's our near shore site, all the way to H3 in the bottom right, that is our offshore site. And if we look at H2, it's the almost picture perfect example of what was going on out there. Um, we had a halocline near midwater level and the dissolved oxygen levels above that halocline were normal and below that they were low to hypoxic and anoxic in some areas. Um, all of that marine life that had died caused by the red tide had sunk to the bottom and was being decomposed by bacteria. However, this halocline prevented any atmospheric oxygen mixing and reaching it to the bottom. And once all the oxygen was used up by the decomposition, it just created basically a feedback loop of, of death below the, the halocline there. Next slide, please. So here's that same um, flow graph from S79, except this is for 2018. So you can see in mid-May, our flows jumped up to above average. And in June, they shot up again. And for the rest of the summer, they were above average. And this can help um, explain why we had that, that halocline there. We had all this fresh water coming in um, and not allowing the, uh, the near shore gulf to mix. Next. So this graph shows the thickness of that hypoxic layer. Um, the blue bars show how far off the bottom that layer was. Um, we are using three milligrams per liter to define hypoxia. Um, some people use two, but we've chosen to go with three and be a little more conservative here. Um, the red dots show the mean concentration of that hypoxic layer. Um, and the gray bars show the different transects. 
So as you move from left to right, you're moving from near shore to offshore. As we're getting into deeper water, we are getting uh, a thicker hypoxic layer. Next. So looking at that same data now as a percentage function of the total water column, you can see the dark blue is our hypoxic layer and the lighter blue is the total water depth. Um, and you can see that it's about 45% average of the water column we found to be hypoxic. Next. So I just rearranged that same data here, going from shallow to deep. And as you can see, as we get into deeper water, we're getting uh, thicker hypoxia layers. Next. So since I had a little more time uh, to present this data today, I could show you a kind of how I looked at it. And one of the ways was using this free tool called Ocean Data View. Um, it's a little tricky to figure out how to use in the first place, but once you know how to use it, um, it's got a couple of cool features. These are those northernmost vertical profiles. Um, and you can see the blue and purples are lower dissolved oxygen level. Um, next. So it has a, a built-in interpolation feature that basically takes those vertical profiles and, and spreads them out. So on the top uh, map, you can see this dark purple area. That is our low dissolved oxygen layer. And on the bottom one, you see that bright red. Uh, that is our low, or, sorry, our high salinity, um, basically our hypoxic layer. Um, our, sorry, our halocline. So this is great, it's a quick tool. These are really fast to make, but you don't really know how accurate they are. Um, next, please. So the next thing I did was um, take it into GIS and do a more in-depth analysis. Um, I used a tool called Empirical Bayesian Krieging, which is a geostatistical interpolation method. Um, this one particularly automates the most difficult aspects of Krieging which is really good if you don't Krieg all the time. It takes some of the guesswork out of it. Um, but the big feature it provides over ocean data view is it allows for cross-validation, allows you to validate how accurate your model is. So in ArcGIS Pro 2.3, they introduce 3D empirical Bayesian Krieging, um, which is perfect for these type of vertical water column profile samples. Um, it has a few features that were necessary to make it work in 3D, um, an elevation inflation factor. If you look at the top right um, image with the dots, you see on the left, the dots are um, vertically very close. And that's what you tend to get when you do water column profiles is you have a lot of very close data points vertically, but then they're spread out horizontally. That causes some problems. The tool allows you to correct for that automatically. Um, which is nice with this elevation inflation factor. We also tend to have vertical trends when we're doing water column profiles, especially in this case, we had high dissolved oxygen on the surface, low or no dissolved oxygen on the bottom. So there's a trend removal feature that helps correct for that. And the lower image shows an example of how you have these vertical samples and then we can export a two-dimensional layer of interpolated between those samples at any elevation or depth we want. Um, so our results for this data, we had a continually ranked probability score, which you don't have to know anything about what means. You just want to know that you want it close to zero. Ours was 0 0.038, which means the model fits very well. Um, and we have a root mean, squ root mean square error of 0. 141, which basically means when the model is making an estimation, it's going to be off by about 0 0.14 milligrams per liter, which is really good in this case. Next. So this animation is showing the data um, in the water column, basically as we peel back layer through layer. And we have um, half meter layers here we're going through with blue being high dissolved oxygen red being low dissolved oxygen. So as we get deeper and further offshore, our dissolved oxygen levels uh, drop dramatically.
Next. Uh, this is the same. Can you do next slide, please? There you go. Um, so these are those same um, two-dimensional layers interpolated from uh, the three-dimensional interpolation at one meter intervals. And the surface area in the top left, the area that we ended up interpolating was uh, 680 square kilometers. Next. So in addition to looking at dissolved oxygen, we looked at the Karenia brevis counts. Um, and if you look at the site in the lower right, O2, um, we had 47 million cells per liter at this site. We had a chlorophyll level um, of over 100 micrograms per liter and a dissolved oxygen at the surface of over 11 milligrams per liter. So while we're talking about hypoxia and anoxia here, we're also finding some of the water column was super saturated due to the Karenia brevis bloom. Now we did sample this site at the last uh, time of the day at, at 3.30. So um, we probably wouldn't have found it this super saturated had we done it first thing in the morning. Um, but it was interesting to, to see this as we were looking for hypoxia. Next. So now we know physically what was the conditions were out there. We wanted to know biologically. The easiest way to do this was to take a look. Um, so we did a few sample visual surveys during the event and post event. We wanted them to be easy to carry out. We didn't have a lot of time to do this. We wanted them quantitative again, since we didn't have a lot of time. Basically wanted to know, is anything alive and document the event. Next. So what did we find? Well, during the hypoxic dead zone event, uh, we found everything was dead. Um, lots of dead invertebrates down there when we sampled. Um, we found brittle stars that looked like they were alive, but they had died. There were no um, macro predators alive to prey on them. Um, so the skeleton was just there um, as they had died and drag your finger through it and all it is is body segments. Um, so it was very depressing on these dives. Next, please. So this video um, was taken at the East Patch Reef in September 2018 during the um, hypoxic dead zone event. Um, you can see we've got a, a dead man had, had in here. Um, and you notice it's basically in perfect condition because like I said, there were no macro predators alive um, to eat any of these dead fish. We've got a dead mantis shrimp here in the 15 plus years I've been diving here, I've never seen a mantis shrimp until this event, and everyone I saw was dead. Disregard the green coloration of the water, it's just how older GoPros act. Um, but what you don't see here is anything swimming. The only two things observed alive on this dive were the two divers themselves. Next, please. In contrast, this video was taken in October 2019, uh, sorry, August 2019. Um, this was taken with our newly acquired ROV, which we were lucky enough to find funds to acquire. In response to this um, event, uh, we wanted to be able to document any future events like this. However, no divers wanted to get in the water after the last time. So we got this ROV, um, which doesn't care how bad the water is. You can see this is what that other reef should have looked like um, under normal conditions. Mangrove snapper, we've got grouper, triggerfish, um, basically a very healthy reef. This is a slightly different reef than the first one. Um, we did survey the other one on the same day. The visibility was just not that good. Um, so we decided to show you this reef, um, but we would expect to see the same um, kind of diversity at the other reef. Next. So what ended our dead zone hypoxia? Well, it was Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Michael came through about 440 miles west of, 
kilometers west of Sanibel in October of 2018. We had a, a significant wave height of over one meter for 40 hours with a maximum wave height of over two meters for 19 hours. Uh, this very well mixed the water column. In our first uh, sampling event post MICO, we found that the uh, mean dissolved oxygen level at the bottom was a 6.4 milligrams per liter. The DO levels since this event have remained normal. Uh, we continue to sample and we will continue to sample more um, should we have another red tide event. We don't know how often this is occurring. Uh, like I said, we found this by accident, but we expect that during times of high flows and significant red tides, this may be occurring more frequently than we had previously been aware. Next, I think that'll do it. Great, and I guess I will take any questions you have. All right, will this okay. be- Okay, uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. And now that we're gonna have the Q&A session open up, for those of you online or even listening by phone, you can go to mentimenti.com and use the code 639808 and enter your questions now. And with that, turn it back to the presenter to start answering these questions as they come in. Um, so will this be a repeating phenomena? We don't know. Um, we suspect that it does happen. Um, like I said, we kind of stumbled upon this after stumbling upon this, we realized that it makes sense with what we saw washing up on shore that this would be happening. Um, so like I said, we are continuing to, to monitor this and we'll increase our monitoring should we or should or when we have another red tide bloom. Um, do the discharges from the river further impact mixing and thus hypoxia? Probably. Um, that's one of the theories we have. Um, we need to do a little more studying on this. We do have a, uh, another project looking at river discharges in regards to red tide. Um, so we're trying to see how they affect red tide. And then, um, like I said, we'll be continuing to do our monitoring um, to try to see if they affect mixing. Um, what is Krieging? Krieging is a GIS interpolation method that allows you to take data, single point data, and interpolate it or figure out what the value would be in between those points. Um, it's a geostatistical method which allows you to validate your model and your prediction as opposed to the other software which I mentioned which you don't really know um, how well the model is. Uh, the free software I used was called Ocean Data View. Um, it's a little tricky to learn um, and I don't really use it that often, uh, but it is great for making those vertical profiles. Um, yeah, as far as where else this is occurring, you know, we sampled um, basically due to the physical limitations uh, of collecting the samples about 680 square kilometers. We know from collaborators this, this occurred further um, up and down the coast. Um, and uh, we expected, you know, it, it to occur further. We just didn't have the, the time to be able to sample everywhere. Uh, what nutrients are most influencing red tide? We don't know at this point. Um, like I said, we do have an NSF funded study um, where we are looking at that. Uh, yes, we continue or we plan on continuing to monitor this. We have monitored. Um, we've done a few more trips since then. Um, we haven't found uh, any stratification on those, um, 
but we, we are doing quarterly monitoring at this point. And should we get into a bad uh, red tide event, um, we'll pick up that monitoring. Um, could we see hypoxia with non-red tide algae blooms? Um, what I didn't have time to get into was um, in those vertical water column profiles, I showed um, the H3 site, which is our furthest offshore site. We actually had something slightly different going on there. We had the hypoxia occur right at the halocline, but then as you get closer to the bottom, um, dissolved oxygen actually increased. And that area we've done some previously, uh, previous red tide, uh, sorry, red drift algae research on. That area has lots of hard limestone outcroppings um, that allows algae to grow. And we think what was going on there is we actually had some oxygen production because of the algae that was alive down there, the macroalgae. Um, if we get to the point where we have tons of macroalgae, like we had in 2005 and stuff, where it was washing up, you know, three feet tall on beach beaches. Um, we could get something similar as all that's decomposing on the bottom. Um, is it reasonably to assume that every hurricane washes nutrients in? Um, I think that's fair to say. Um, you know, 2005, we had a, a bad red tide year. We also had a lot of um, freshwater flow that year. Um, I think what was different about Irma was we had flooding on lands that hadn't been flooded in 100 years. So you had all those legacy nutrients that had built up on those lands that, that made it in. Um, and I should mention, we don't have a lot of nutrient data from, from there. Um, we tend to have relatively low nutrients in our system, even though we talk about the nutrient problem, but we have high flows. So even though we have low nutrients, we have a lot and steady stream of them. And it looks like I'm out of time. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for that presentation. And I just want to let everybody know that you can find these abstracts 